Bob from, uh, from Dan Popoff from the University of Texas, Arlington Kindle, running human-like facial expressions for the android Philip K. Dick, which is, is also one of David's robots. So let's, let's first have a round of applause for our da David Henry. And uh, then you can hear a bit more about what you can do with uh, learning for Phil Dick. All right, well, thank you. So uh, it's great to be here. Uh, and uh, so, and also, uh, uh, my talk basically will uh, take uh, from where uh, David left off and show you a little bit behind the hood on what's going on with the puppeteering. But actually, what, what my uh, talk will be going towards is what happens if we take that kinetic and we present it uh, to Philip K. Dick so that now Philip K. Dick's expressions could be sensed and in turn used by him to change, change his behavior on the fly. Okay, so imagine uh, that now we're taking the Kinect and presenting the uh, robot uh, to the Kinect. I'm sorry, is this for database or is this from a monetary point of view? This, you... this is going to be uh, uh, related to online learning, but we'll okay. uh, get to that in a second. So, um, my lab at UT Arlington, uh, we do three basic things, but they're mostly related to control and learning uh, for human-robot interactions. So one of the projects uh, uh, currently going on is creating robot skin, which is sensorized to do physical human-robot interactions. So imagine uh, a whole, uh, whole arm is covered uh, with this material, where you can essentially guide it, uh, uh, kinesthetically teach it, um, or provide safe uh, behavior. Uh, and this would be uh, used in industrial robots as well as uh, uh, humanoid robots. Um, another topic uh, which I'm going to talk today is uh, interacting with the robot using, uh, by recognizing different poses and gestures, and then synthesizing them. So we've done quite a bit of work with Xeno. Um, looking at simple behaviors like face tracking and uh, 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 motion control of the neck and, uh, and eye uh, motion together so that the interaction appears realistic. So here you see a problem with saliency, a robot was tracking one person, there's another person in the world. And Another uh, topic here is, uh, let's see if I can play this video. Uh, interaction with uh, uh, robots using uh, non-intuitive uh, uh, interfaces. So in that case, there's a headband for controlling the, uh, this mobile manipulator. <coughs> so the question is, how do you map the input space, that is the gesture input from a person, to the uh, actions of the robot? So in this case, the place his left eye, the robot takes the left. I mean, sure, right? Everyone looks false in that robot. Mm -hmm. sure. <laughs> yes. Uh, so, but you see the problem, it's very, it's sort of an arbitrary thing. So the question of adaptation would be, you start with some guess of this mapping, but then you want to change that to help the human operate the robot in the way. So, uh, coming back to this problem of uncanny value. Um, there are uh, four very important components of HRI, right? The, on one hand, there's appearance. And so here, David's robots are unprecedented in terms of uh, what they can offer. Uh, and so if you uh, make the appearance uh, unlikable, then that's the first step, right? You have to fight against that. So you have to, uh, you know, to tune the appearance to be likable to begin with. Uh, then there is uh, dialogue in the sense of speech, right? So we talk and then we expect a response. If that is not tuned and, and realistic, then, then we are in the valley. So if the robot stops for the shrieking voice that is not tuned to, to the appearance, then there is a problem. Uh, facial expressions. If uh, facial expressions start to be unpleasant for us, right? If the expressions are totally disgusting, then we're going to be in the valley. Uh, and lastly, body language. So if you have a body or if you have a neck, then you have to tune those expressions as well. So I think that this problem of uncanny valley is you have to work on all those four things. And if one of them is off, then you're going to be in the valley. But if you can 
Can we vote with them at the same time? I think we're not going to have a problem with the uncanny. But on. So uh, I met David in 2005, and of course, you know, he's already shown me this, uh, this work with uh, Einstein. Uh, so since then, we've also worked with Zeno, so we're looking at imitation. So uh, this is monkey see, monkey do. So we're looking at the uh, imitation studies with children, uh, in particular with three children, to see if we can actually quantify autism severity from motor, motor markers. So the idea is you, you have a robot present a certain social action, such as waving, um, uh, or another so, uh, social cue, uh, fist bumping, then you see the response. Uh, and you can on the fly um, compare the motions. And if the motions are very dissimilar, you can say, well, this person doesn't have social skills, or this person is more autistic. So we try to test that hypothesis. Um, and so I'll show you this video. We uh, have Zeno perform certain actions. These are scripted actions in this case, where we can have a puppeteer in the background uh, do those actions. And then we see what the child does. So this is actually my son in a motion capture lab trying to keep up with Zeno. This is a video which I recorded he was three. And so you can see that he, he imitates the motion. Now, we're not looking at exact but sometimes he doesn't. We're not looking at exact temporal match, right? But we're looking to see that the emotions are similar. Okay, so then we can look at, at uh, um, how well uh, these motions are indicated. Uh, so in the, uh, the uh, going back to this idea of adaptation, um, so we use reinforcement learning, uh, sort of a, a, a different brand of reinforcement learning, which works online. A big fan on online schemes. Uh, this is the first appeared at what's called animal learning, and this is how we learn. But these learning schemes happen continuously. This is not batch processing. You present a whole bunch of data, you learn it, and then you play it back. This is more like adaptive control. So I was very, actually very happy with Mark's talk this morning because this is the key to uh, learning behaviors, optimizing behaviors. Uh, you just have to provide these connections and the tools and then turn this on if you have different neural nets or different uh, uh, neurons, right? And it converges, right? You turn it on and it just works. It's yeah, like magic. It's so, so the key is how you connect it. So in the case of the interface, here's a, 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 how we look at it. So this is a scheme called uh, uh, TV Lambda Temporal uh, Difference Learning. It's been around for about 20 years. And you have a policy, an actor, typically this is the robot, right? You have a certain control policy which changes uh, by a critic. So you have a critic that's evaluating whether the behavior is positive, the cost function is minimized, and you have a bunch of rewards. So typically, uh, the learning has occurred in the past through this policy. In the, in the, uh, um, so what we're doing uh, lately is actually we're not learning any policy. So when you're teleoperating, what is changing is actually this map between the interface input of the operator and the effect it has on the robot. Okay, so it's slightly modified. What we're saying is, imagine you have a joystick and you're driving a robot, right? Somebody has set the gains on that joystick, right? Uh, your action, let's say, with, with one one of the controls leads to some uh, <coughs> velocity and some degree of freedom, right? But that is preset. We're, what we're saying is that based on the results, we want to change that mapping on the fly using this DD line. Okay, so that's very powerful because essentially we are helping the user control the robot better on that. So uh, another uh, application of this is uh, this problem of uh, head-eye interaction. So the problem here is uh, with a with a humanoid robot uh, exhibiting a property of uh, joint attention. You want a robot to recognize a human and track the human. So the question now is, uh, how do we do it with uh, joint motion of our neck and eyes, right, so that it appears realistic? It depends on where the object is, how fast it moves. So if it's close to 
my eyes and I want to move my eyes to track it. And if it's far away, I want to move my head. And if it's in between, I want to have a combination of the motions. So we have, uh, on the one hand, a user that's tracking an object on, on the screen, so we can actually record uh, the combination of neck and eye at the same time. And then we compare that with what the robot does. In fact, we can learn that and then play it back to the robot, and the conversation will appear more natural. So, uh, we have uh, recently, I'm, uh, I've been hosting uh, Phil, Philip K. Dick, uh, in my lab, as, as well as you know. Uh, so, the same basic demo that uh, you see here is uh, running with the robot through a simple kinetic. search algorithm for selecting the expressions. <coughs> this is essentially automated, so you take your next generation Android, you present it to the Kinect, it runs through this data collection, and then at the end of it you have tuned expressions. So it's general enough to be used on human <coughs> Android Androids or not. So uh, in the future, we uh, we want to uh, uh, you know, look at uh, design improvements on the robot itself that will actually uh, 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 minimize this difference. And uh, another thing I wanted to say is, uh, in this case, face and eyes, and so some of the uh, uh, accurate space of the robot is decoupled. So, so mouth motion has a little to do with eye, eyebrow motion. So it makes no sense to train the uh, neural neck for the whole space. So we have it decoupled right now. But we want to actually look at <coughs> full face, uh, not just mouth, but also eyes and so on. Uh, also couple that with the uh, neck and eye movement. So uh, the goal would be to try to lip sync. So you can recognize speech as well as uh, Expressions and generate uh, and generate them uh, in a in a natural way for the robot. So I acknowledge uh, two minutes from NSF supporting this work and uh, uh, some help from uh, Hanson Robotics and the Institute. Thank you very much. Thanks, thanks for the talk. And uh, any any questions for uh, Dan? Sure, for future work, um, uh, <clears throat> the extension into what like, um, non-ethnic uh, classification of facial expression um, would require um, uh, mapping between the full range of possible expressivity of the face and the um, and, uh, context, like the social context, for example. So a um, uh, professor uh, of mine at UT Dallas, um, Alice O'Toole, uh, in the, about 10 years ago, was capturing um, natural expressions elicited by Disney movies. So you had uh, test participants that would sit alone in a room there was nobody watching them. Um, I mean, there was a camera watching them, of course, but um, they were watching a Disney movie, and they would spontaneously emote um, as, the, um, as the movie was, was played. And the expressions never repeated. You, you could sometimes classify them, but often the expressions and their variations um, were, uh, you know, awkward to fit into the facial action coding system. And, um, and uh, always different than what the differences were, certainly weren't um, classifiable by the communication question for the system. What the meaning of those differences it, is remains a mystery, uh, effectively. Um, the ability for robots to generate those facial expressions can kind of pop out of a system like this naturally, but what they mean and how you um, in, play them in a context and recognize them in a context um, it seems like a rich area for investigation, um, 
do you have any ideas or plans for um, how this might uh, be used for exploring that? So what I would say uh, to that is I go back to this to this uh, to this animal learning. Mm -hmm. uh, so you know, don't worry about this here, but just this. so key here is that if you have the right rewards and if you have the right critic, this will always work. But the key is what is the right reward, what's the right critic. So who's the critic? So I would ask you, who's the critic of, of uh, whether those expressions mean something or they, they don't? So if, if you have a way to evaluate them, I mean, that would be one. And then you would want to encourage some and discourage others. Mm -hmm. So if you can tell PKD how to do that, then he can select those, he can arrive at those uh, but but the key is how to how to evaluate them and how to describe them. So if, if you if you were um, collecting uh, data from human human interactions, enough data about the context and the the expressions listed. So for example, in that Disney movie, you could be uh, recording the Disney movie using some kind of intelligent system to try to understand the, um, the semantics of the content in the Disney movie. Um, the, the, the emotional meaning to the human mind, right? And then um, understand the, the um, basically uh, classify the various um, uh, expressions that humans would spontaneously affect uh, while watching the, the movie. And then, um, uh, then you would have some kind of semantic classification um, of expressions in a social context, um, which doesn't necessarily give you the reward here. But if you can say that then those expressions um, serve some purpose in a social context. That would be it. Right, exactly. So if we were making expressions at each other, we are, as we're talking right at this moment unconsciously, we can't help it, right? It just it sort of flows out of us. Um, what was the evolutionary reward for making these kinds of expressions in that in that context? And so we have the behavior we could have the behavioral information in that social context, but figuring out the human reward structure could um, then give you the reward yeah. perhaps to um, make it uh, super normal, maybe hyper manipulative, <laughs> um, if you had, um, or, or effective uh, affect um, in a certain context. So, yeah, so again, I don't have the answer to your question, but I, I know that if we can work on the reward and the critic and put the right, uh, you know, the right inputs there, you can get some very nice behavior, which, uh, you know, which, uh, Maybe easy to implement too. Yeah, it seems it seems that when humans learn to make appropriate facial expressions, we're relying on quite quite subtle cues in the facial expression of the other person. So it, it, it's it's not like we're just getting a a high level reward signal like this facial expression is good, or this facial expression I'm making is bad, and then we have to do such a complicated assignment of credit now to figure out like how much credit this little actuator movement in the jaw gave, or this little actuator movement in the side of the eye gave, to get this good or bad signal. So now we, we get, we recognize something subtle in the other person's face, which through some kind of combination of inbuilt and learned wiring, we can then map to corrections to specific parts of the face. Like I think at some level, if I make a face that looks wrong and you react somehow, I can trace that back to what's happening in my mouth or maybe the way I was looking in my eye without having to do so much search as a reinforcement learning algorithm would have to do to do the, the assignment of credit. So there, there, there's some subtle perception, action, feedback there that helps with reinforcement learning. You've been presented with lots of faces, and of course you've started by indicating others on some of them. Uh, but with humans, we have the same anatomy, so uh, the 
face that you make, you know, I can make the same face with the same muscle. muscle Are you sure? Can you do this one? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, but PKE doesn't have the same muscle, so it's a little more difficult for him. Uh, but it would be interesting to see what would happen if you're in the critic. You uh, took not just the profile of the actual motors that are used, but also the limit stops. So when you set a servo, right, yeah. there's a maximum minimum yeah. limit. Say, for example, when you're watching a really funny George Carlin movie, and the thing is, your first time you laugh, but by the end of the movie, you know, you're barely going, ha, 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 Something similar like this. If all of a sudden I'm engaging in interaction with the robot, right, and basically the total conversation reaches a sort of like natural, if all of a sudden the critic could sort of like, you know, just restrict, you know, so all of a sudden I'm no longer super expressive, like some sort of Super Mario character, but as time goes by, all of a sudden I wind up habituating to a much smaller range, a much more efficient range of, uh, of gestures. Um, two advantages. Number one is that it shows a level of habituation, but also it's much faster. So what happens means now is that because the range of your motors wants to be much smaller, you can want to put in a much greater range of um, emotions of all of a sudden the conversation or in fact the interaction basically has to uh, accelerate. And what will be fascinating, and I know, I know I've actually seen some things where you can, um, you can take an extremely expressive face and then reduce it down to just the subtlest actions, even on like cartoon characters. And the fact is, is that just those subtle actions are basically all that's necessary to appropriately convey an appropriate expression. Provided, of course, there's been a habituation from the original uh, um, uh, exhaustive expressions. I mean, even from cartoon characters that basically want to make something very impressive. And it's one of the things that basically drives people very nuts inside video games. First time you come across a super expressive character, and they're always like this all the time. It's the Disney sidekick conundrum, right? <laughs> Why do we hate Jar Jar Binks? Because he's the same annoying he, tit from the beginning he, of the series to the end of it. He, he doesn't <laughs> tell the character or the PA that he's But in this thing, the thing is that you want. But you've got a beautiful little mechanism here. Your critic basically is a beautiful little mechanism. And the fact is, is that as the situation goes on, all of a sudden the, the critic just keeps counter. Oh, we just had that expression. We just had that expression. Every time we get an expression, reduce the limits. Right, you reduce, reduce the servo limits by a small amount, so all of a sudden the expression is there. I think what you find out is that the range of um, subtle expression would actually make it an awful lot more humanistic. Just, just a suggestion. Um, uh, a, couple, a couple of points. Um, uh, probably a good idea is to put uh, current sensors on the motors because when you get these multi motors in these exotic combinations of facial expressions, they they um, pull against each other. So if you run a genetic algorithm through all of its uh, extreme motions, you'll get these highly contorted motions that uh, the face really wasn't. Well, funny as hell. Did you see some of those? Those are the best ones to train this, you know. <laughs> yeah, because oh, yeah, yeah, like, they show the extremes. But if you have, if you, if you have the, cur the current sensors, then you could limit the range of motions to non-destructive positions. Sure. It might be oh, right, right, right. nice to run the robot. Well, so <laughs> but, 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 I don't like the maintenance costs. But, 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 but this is this is why, for example, like basically making the critic capable of sort of setting the limits on the servos. Yeah. You could put in an absolute map that basically is high, never faster than this, never beyond that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. You know. But then, of course, what happens is as you reduce that, then all of a sudden the expected lifetime of these things are okay. Yeah. Oh, well, it's the Philip K. Dick head now. It's like almost twenty, isn't it? Oh, no. It's been around for a while. This is the child of the son of the bride of the folk. Oh, is it? Okay. It's well, it's a sequel. Um, yeah. But it's, yeah, the first one was 2005, um, and it kind of got lost in transit. And then the, um, the Dutch Public Broadcasting commissioned a, a rebuild of the robot in 2010. And so. Um, well, what is a lifetime? I mean, for example, um, you're running these so things It's been for running since 2010. So we've had it for about a year. Uh, it's it's had um, you know one one repair because of uh, limits, uh, as I mentioned. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, a few nights of running. But uh, since then, it's been running fine. The 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 front or last, the motors don't. So yeah, I've had the front or since 2005, and it's still the same. In fact, I have some with me. Well, no, the front or is great, but I was just wondering, for example, like, it's obviously you need the extremes. Right, but I was just yeah. thinking, you know, like, um, it'd be fascinating to find out, you know, if you create this, you put in limited situation, how much longer it would basically run the servo. Yeah, so but I also, how much more naturalist you could actually make the interfaces and the nature of the, of the behaviors you got. I mean, once you're back, you're going to need the extremes, of course, when you're setting up your, your genetic algorithm. But ultimately, I want to see something that basically exposes and moves an awful lot of different, like, micro expressions yeah. Yeah. while I'm basically espousing. For example, like, not just staring at you, but, you know, like, shaking the eyes every now and again, you know. Like, <laughs> like the Simpsons characters do, you're like, hi, how can you tell I'm lying? I'm not lying, right? You know? <laughs>
classic animation tricks and techniques that essentially are, you know, like just uh, standard animation tropes. Anyway, just fascinating. Pretty cool. Well, I, I, I just want to point out one more thing, which is if you were to connect um, this system with um, something that's more AGI flavored, able to understand and map uh, the conversational context um, over a series of interactions over a period of time, then you'd be able to um, get your reinforcement um, through that chain of reasoning and effect. So, you, like if you have a, a large goal that requires multiple sequences, then you might not realize that the gesture that you made a few minutes ago was wrong until something goes wrong. Um, you know, at this later point in the conversation, it really can require that kind of um, in, that deeper intelligent feedback. Um, uh, and that that kind of um, but, but that, that requires like you know like that, 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 that requires like you know like an AI presence of an internal dialogue. You know, like hi, I'm talking to you, and all of a sudden I have an epiphany. My eyebrows go up, and so it's hey, here's a point that basically I wish I made four hours ago, right? Well, sure. Know? And it's the same basically. It's back to your point. It's like you know watching uh, Disney movies in the dark and crying into your uh, your teddy bear. I mean, like you know. I know that's what you love to do on the weekends, but I mean, yeah. <laughs> no, but the, the thing was, is that like a turn pile, right? And like, well, you don't yeah. expect anything else. So was that but another question? Yeah. Just, just a quick question. So, um, has anybody ever studied the impact of the thing? I think. But, but there's actually a simple answer to this. And that is, as soon as the robot breaks attention, right? Okay, so, you know, like a robot that's just like a big attention to you, as soon as it breaks attention, as soon as it turns its eyes away, right? Or you recognize that it basically is undergoing going you know, like classic repetitious loops. I mean, the real beautiful value of your of your uh, technology right now is, is that you're going to come up with something like this that has a human right arrangement, so that when I'm discussing with it, all of a sudden it's doing something different all the time. If you basically uh, look at a lot of the original Japanese animation, which is also like you know, or in the dub it any language they want, um, the fact is is that unless you know, like you start blowing up Tokyo, there's going to be no interest in basically maintaining contact with those characters. So the beautiful thing about this is that it basically has the potential of basically being a subtlety technology. That is, allows machines to all of a sudden have a range of interaction that basically would engage somebody for a long time. You got to basically a short-term, short-term memory with attention. Okay, but if you want to basically guarantee that you basically get everything from a dog's attention to a human being's attention, they got to basically make certain that they focus on you, track you, and basically sort of engage in that. So as soon as they look away, right? It's like it was very simple behavior. Yeah. I mean, that Well, well, more social studies, and I think um, uh, also artists will often uh, apply contradictory expressions. And so, if you have a character who's like um, who's crying, obviously, like in some kind of despair and grief, and yet also smiling and laughing at the same time, can actually make that seem like more um, uh, powerful in emotion. Like the grief just seems all the more powerful. So artists can intuit this. You might see it naturally um, in, in human context, but but it, it may be um, counterintuitive um, uh, if you're going to say, well, it, you know, emotion means this. Grief emotion is uh, like this from facial action coding system. Therefore, all characters that are grieving must look like that. But, but then, then you're, you you actually wind up with something that's less expressive. I mean, the robots have different kinds of muscles. If we build them right, then they'll they'll look identifiable as human-like expressions that are meaningful to us. But um, Einstein there, I mean, he's only got three motors in his face. The one motor makes him smile and frown, one motor makes his brow go up, 